Welcome to this time of worship. We continue to tackle those tough questions from a biblical perspective, and today we address that question that sometimes people ask, does the church just care about my money? Let's join in our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice. For the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us, that we may live for you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Help us receive each new blessing with thanksgiving and use them to your glory and for the benefit of others. For you live and rule with your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is taken from Genesis chapter 14, where Abram rescues his nephew Lot. He makes sure that all the credit for all that he has goes to God. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. But Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Honor, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went and pursued as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hoba, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Cato Lamor, and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread, of the strap of a sandal, so that you'll never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. This is the word of the Lord.
Our epistle reading and today's sermon is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 6. Glory be to you, O Lord. We hear the words of Jesus. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we studied together God's Word as we have it in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, beginning there at verse 1, read to you previously. And I would encourage you to take your bulletin and turn to the last printed page and follow along to find the answers to the questions that might be raised in the sermon. I don't come to church because it has too many hypocrites. How would you answer that objection? Over the years, I've learned to reply, there's always room for one more. Or how about, I don't come to the worship services because it's always the same old stuff. One longtime Christian had the answer to that objection. He said, I sit down to the table two or three times a day to eat my wife's cooking, even though it's always or mainly the same old stuff, because I need the nourishment. And then there's the objection I don't give to the church because salvation is supposed to be free. Years ago in her question and answer column, Ann Landers, remember her? Ann Landers handled that objection. She squashed it by saying, the water that you drink and that you use so profusely is free, but somebody has to pay for the piping. You ready for one more objection this morning as we continue our series of sermons on those hard questions and objections and find the sure answers in the word of our God? And that's the question that's frequently asked, why does the church always ask for my money? In answer, we'll find that Christ indeed does ask for our money. But secondly that he asks for much more than our money. Did you catch what was really wrong with that question? Why does the church always ask for our money? It's not ours. It's the Lord's. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians reminds us, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything we have, every dollar I have in my pocket or in my savings account or every possession on which I think I have put my brand isn't really mine. Everything I am and have belongs to the Lord. So when we talk about the church wanting our money, we need to be very careful. It's not ours. It's his. He only gives it to us to manage for him. And that's why we call it stewardship, managing it, not owning it, but managing it for our Lord. And if we have trouble accepting that truth, all you have to do is just once watch a funeral procession on the way to the cemetery. Tell me, when's the last time that you saw a hearse pulling a U-Haul behind it, filled with the gifts or the the treasures of the dead person. Or tell me, when's the last time you saw more than just that casket in that cement vault and and all of the treasures piled there or left behind on the green grass of this life? Now, since our money is really Christ, we should understand when he speaks to us about how to use it, and he does more times than what we might even imagine. Now, those who do the counting, who note the facts, who like to do these things, they tell us there are over 1,500 references to what we call stewardship in the Bible. And that half of Jesus' parables, in one way or another, refer to the subject of Christian giving. And that one verse out of every six in the New Testament deals with the question of money or covetousness. Yes, indeed, 
The Lord does talk to us about money, his money, not mine, but his money. And he's concerned about how I use his money. He even goes so far as to giving directions, guidelines through his apostle as to how he wants us to use his money for his kingdom, for his church. In 1 Corinthians, he wrote, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Give it regularly, he said, first day of every week. Set your offering aside, he said, not just give what was left in the pocket. And do it proportionately, he says, according to what the Lord has given you. Now, why do you think that Jesus talks so much about money and his apostles? It's not that he needs our money, no. He created the heavens and the earth without asking a nickel or a dime from his creatures. He raised Lazarus from the dead without having Mary and Martha cash in their savings. He keeps spreading his gospel here and across the world regardless what offerings his people bring. Now, he doesn't need our money. You know why he asks for it? He asks for our money so that he gives us the opportunity to show what's in our heart and that we really belong to him. You know, by birth, we're, we're selfish creatures. Right at the top of the list of our vocabulary is I, me, and mine. And right up at the top of the list in my daily life is that concern selfishly for me. And when Christ takes over my heart, then it becomes that selfless concern for others and that bringing of our earthly goods that he gives us to use it for him and others and for his church. And one area in which that blessed change can really show forth so clearly is in how I use his money. You know, though, Christ wants more than our money. He wants me. He wants me totally. He wants me, body, soul, and spirit. The way Paul puts it in our text almost takes our breath away. Offer your bodies, he says, as living sacrifices to God. When he says bodies, he means my body and life, me, and all that I am, and all that I have. When the Israelites of the Old Testament brought their bullocks or their lambs or their doves as sacrifices, that sacrifice then belonged totally to the Lord, absolutely 100%. And that sacrifice was not to be inferior, not to be something they wanted to get rid of, but the best that they had and could offer. And not only that, uh, from them he wanted that kind of sacrifice because he wanted to impress on them the sacrifice he was going to give with his son totally for them on the cross of Calvary. He wants me, me and all that I am and have, to give our, my life totally, willingly, sacrificially to him. You notice what else he called it? A living sacrifice. Those lambs and those bulls were sacrificed only once. They were slaughtered, cut up, and then burned on the altar, <laughs> and they were gone. But our sacrifice is to be a living one, one that goes on day after day, totally, in our daily life. So whether I'm a husband or a wife, a father or a mother, a son or a daughter, a teacher or a student, a boss or a worker, or you name it. Wherever he has put me, he wants me to recognize that how I handle the situation in which he has put me is my way of giving myself as a sacrifice 
totally to him. And he calls that a sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. <laughs> you know, when I look back past week at my sacrifice to the Lord, I have to imagine the Lord almost smiling in heaven, but like some indulgent father looking down at his son who bumbled his way across another week trying to bring his sacrifices to the Lord. And he calls that, though, our spiritual worship. Grumbling, complaining? No. Getting turned off or getting tired? No. What kind of sacrifice? Paul says, you. You and all that you are and all that you have every day of your life. Me, a sacrifice. As I look back, as I said a minute ago, how did it go? We just sang it. It's the hymn that most of us love. Take myself and I will be ever, only, all for thee. But did I tell the Lord, you know, Lord, yes, take my moments and my days, but you know, it's kind of humid out there in this Wisconsin Sunday, so I don't know, maybe I'll just stay home and watch the telly. Or Lord, uh, take my moments and my days, but you know, we were out late Saturday night and it's kind of hard to get out of bed in time for church. Or Lord, take my moments and my days, but you know, Lord, we're on vacation. And, you know, we've got to drive 20, 30 miles to find one of our churches. Or did I sing, take my will and make it thine? And then some pet sin, and we all have them, worked its way into the fabric of my life, and it became, keep your fingers off of that, Lord. They're your will and my will part company. Or did I vow, take my hands, my feet, my voice, my lips, but then sidestepped when asked to serve, like here at Good Shepherd, with Lord, you know I've done my share. You know how busy I am, Lord. Besides, why don't others do something more? And we even haven't said a word yet about our silver and our gold. Nobody and nothing can force us into offering ourselves fully to the Lord. There's only one force that can make us want to be living sacrifices for our God. Paul said it in five short words. He said, in view of God's mercy. And with those five short words, he takes us all the way back to eternity. And he shows us the invisible heart of our loving God, a heart that so loved that it planned sending his son into that manger of smelly straw with the beating heart that was there for the sins of the whole world. It was a love so great that it had that son then nailed up on that cross where his heart stopped beating because he was paying for the sins of the world. Those words that in view of God's mercy, they take me to the scriptures that we use, the worship that we use, the Bible or the baptismal font, the, the communion altar, where he comes to us with that love, that loving heart, and then even brings us and draws us to himself. And just wait, just wait until the day when we can feel that loving, beating heart of our God next to ours as he carries us safely to heaven. When God fills our hearts with the love from his heart, then we have to say, he loved me and gave himself for me. And then we'll say, the life I now live I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah, when somebody objects, all the church wants is our money. 
right? You've heard it, I've heard it. And next time you hear it, you know what to say. Tell them, you've got it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. It wants much more than just money. It wants you. It wants you totally, perfectly, completely. May God in his mercy make us into such sacrifices. Amen. And now having heard that rich word of our God, let's join in confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed printed in your folder and up on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Gracious Lord, how do we thank you for all that you've done for us? Let us not be as the wicked who receive but never acknowledge, who take but never give. Deliver us from all selfishness and gratitude and covetousness. Fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit so that we truly believe that we in our entirety belong to you. Our time, our thoughts and talents, our mind, money and possessions, our strength, service and wills, they're all yours. Help us show that we believe this by putting them into practice. Since only offerings given out of love for Christ are acceptable in your sight, increase our love by diligent use of your word and frequent attendance at your Holy Supper. Inspire us to dedicate to your use all that we are and all that we have. Lord Jesus, look with favor on your servants who are sick, hurting, or hospitalized. We entrust to your care Don Zitlow dealing with health problems and David Walter recovering from a medical procedure. Be with them in their time of need, bless their medical care and treatment, and grant them your healing power. Lord, we also pray that you would send comfort and encouragement to Steve Wills and his family, whose grandmother passed away. Jesus, thank you for the great victory you won over sin and death for her and for all of us. Teach us all to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom and so be saved. Lord, we ask for the continued blessings upon Pastor David Brandt and his ministry in Juneau as he's declined his call to serve here at Good Shepherd. We pray, Lord, that in your time you would provide us with the called worker we need to meet our needs. Lord, today we also rejoice with Kenneth Blaine who will receive the blessings of holy baptism this evening. Thank you for the rich blessings you poured out upon him sending the Holy Spirit to work in his heart and helping to treasure life as a child of God. Help him always to treasure his baptism as he wears that glorious robe of righteousness which Jesus won for him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has called us to be his own, that we might live under him in his kingdom, 
and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and we join their glorious song. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we now approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift you fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you on the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.